In this video on advanced EKG interpretation, I'll be discussing sinus node dysfunction and the sixth sinus syndrome. The learning objectives are first to list the manifestations and etiologies of sinus node dysfunction, second to recognize sinus arrhythmia, sinus pauses, and sinus arrest, next to distinguish the various types of SA nodal exit block, and last to define and recognize sixth sinus syndrome including the tachycardia bradycardia variant. So what exactly is meant by the term sinus node dysfunction? This is a broad category of electrophysiological defects of either impulse formation within the sinus node and or propagation from the sinus node into the atria. There are six main defects, sinus arrhythmia, sinus pauses, sinus arrest, and SA nodal exit block each of which will be discussed in more detail in the upcoming minutes. Defects also include an inappropriate sinus bradycardia, which is not defined by a specific bradycardic threshold in terms of beats per minute, but is instead more vaguely defined as a heart rate insufficient to meet the body's demand. Similar to this is something called chronotropic incompetence. This is an inability of a patient's heart rate to increase in response to increased physical activity or other increase in physiologic demand. So a patient with chronotropic incompetence may have a normal appearing heart rate at rest. Chronotropic incompetence results in exercise intolerance and is an independent marker of cardiovascular mortality, yet it's probably under-recognized since the problem can only be detected by exercising the patient. It's important to realize that the first four items on the list, along with an appropriate sinus bradycardia, can occur in normal people during sleep, particularly endurance athletes, and in that context is not usually pathologic. As a hospitalist, I commonly encounter patients who are admitted to the hospital and placed on telemetry for some reason other than suspected sinus node dysfunction, and are found to have periods of bradycardia into the 40s while sleeping, with or without sinus pauses in the neighborhood of two seconds, as long as it's confined to sleep and not thought to be associated with other suspected problems these patients do not need to be evaluated for a pacemaker and usually actually require no workup whatsoever. Etiologies of sinus node dysfunction include age-related sinus node fibrosis, atrial remodeling as seen in AFib and heart failure, atherosclerosis of the SA nodal artery, infiltrative disease such as amyloidosis, post-cardiac surgery, various medications, most notably beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, amiodarone and digoxin, hypothyroidism, and hypothermia. Uh, the first several of these tend to be irreversible, such as um, heart failure, AFib, uh, and certainly age-related fibrosis. But the last several tend to be reversible, such as the hypothyroidism, hypothermia, and drug toxicity. If you correct those underlying problems, the sinus node function goes away. And the course of sinus node dysfunction that can be seen following cardiac surgery varies depending upon the specific procedure performed. So now let's take a look at what some of the manifestations of sinus node dysfunction look like on EKG. First up is sinus arrhythmia. The P to P interval between successive beats normally varies slightly even when the P waves are identical and the PR segment is constant. However, if the shortest and longest PP intervals differ by more than 10%, the patient is said to have sinus arrhythmia. I've seen a few different definitions of sinus arrhythmia out there, but this one seems to be the most common. There are two variations. First is the most common respiratory sinus arrhythmia, sometimes called physiologic sinus arrhythmia, in which the P to P interval varies based upon the patient's respiratory cycle. The less common variation is, predictably enough, called non-respiratory sinus arrhythmia, in which there is no relationship to the respiratory cycle. Here's an example of respiratory sinus arrhythmia, and to help understand what's going on, I'll label when the patient is expiring and inspiring. As you can see, the sinus rate increases during inspiration and decreases during expiration, with a relatively smooth transition in rate. This pattern is caused by changes in vagal tone secondary to complex reflex mechanisms interconnecting the pulmonary and cardiovascular systems. Now contrast that with non-respiratory sinus arrhythmia, in which there is significant beat-to-beat -beat variation in the P2P interval that does not have any discernible pattern. 
Important to note is that all of the P waves have the same morphology, implying that they are all originating from the same focus, presumably the sinus node. Both types of sinus arrhythmia are more pronounced and usually easier to identify at slower rates. The next abnormality is SA nodal exit block, often abbreviated SA exit block, or sometimes even SA block. It occurs when impulses originating from within the sinus node are blocked from reaching the rest of the atria. This results in either a delay or an absence of the P wave. Identification of SA nodal exit block can be difficult for two main reasons. First, depolarization of the sinus node itself produces no discernible waveform on the EKG. And second, concurrent presence of either form of sinus arrhythmia can limit the identification of the specific patterns of changing PP intervals that are characteristic of SA exit block. There are multiple types, referred to as degrees, of SA exit block. These are very analogous to the three degrees of AV block. In first degree SA exit block, all sinus node discharges are propagated to the atria, but with delay. However, since the sinus node itself produces no waveform, and all sinus node impulses are eventually conducted, this is indistinguishable from normal on surface EKG, and it can only be identified during an EP study when a wire is literally sitting in the SA node with another in the atria. In second degree SA exit block, some sinus node discharges are propagated while others are blocked. As with second degree AV block, there are two main types. Type 1, rarely referred to as Wenke Bach SA block, the PP intervals progressively decrease prior to a pause in the rhythm associated with a missing P wave. The typical pause duration is less than the sum of the two prior PP intervals or cycles. It sometimes confuses people that with a V block, the PR interval progressively prolongs, yet in SA block, the PP interval progressively decreases, but that's just what's seen. In this case, the PP interval is sort of analogous to the RR interval decrease that's seen in classic type 1 second degree AV block. Now in type 2 second degree block, the PP intervals are integer multiples of the presumed sinus node rate. In this case, the typical pause duration is equal to the sum of the two prior PP cycles. Finally, in third degree SA exit block, no SA node discharges are propagated to the atria. From an EKG, this is indistinguishable from sinus arrest, a situation in which the sinus node appears to completely fail. So to summarize, only second degree block is identifiable from EKG. Here are examples of types 1 and 2 second degree SA block. In type 1 block, the PP interval gradually decreases until there appears to be a missing P wave with an associated pause in the overall rhythm. In addition to the pause duration being less than the sum of the two previous PP intervals, also notice that the PP interval after the pause is typically longer than the PP interval before the pause. Contrast this with type 2 block. Here the PP interval is constant until a missing P wave associated with a pause that is exactly twice the duration of the two prior PP intervals. In this case, the PP interval after the pause should be the same as the one before the pause. Keep in mind that a diagnosis of SA exit block from the EKG is rarely this clear. In reality, patients demonstrate moment-to-moment -moment changes in vagal tone, and even changes that fall short of classifying a sinus arrhythmia can impact these intervals enough to make it uncertain which type of SA block is occurring, or even make it uncertain whether block is occurring at all, or whether what is being observed is simply severe sinus arrhythmia. Next up is sinus pauses. A sinus pause is a temporary interruption in sinus rhythm caused by failure of impulse generation within the SA node. There is a variety of opinions on the threshold for how long a pause must be before it's considered a sinus pause, but either two or three seconds is commonly cited. Sinus pauses need to be distinguished from exit block, which may not be possible without an EP study. Although sinus pauses are usually in the two to three second range, they can be 10 seconds or even longer, and therefore can result in syncope. A sinus arrest is when there is prolonged failure of impulse generation within the SA node, 
It's sort of like a sinus pause that lasts a really, really long time or is even permanent. There is no conventional cutoff of how long a sinus pause needs to be in order for it to be considered a sinus arrest. Sinus arrest can be very dangerous as it will result in asystole if there's not an escape rhythm present. In this particular example, we have an apparent sinus arrest with a junctional escape rhythm in the low 40s. Now that I've discussed all the various forms of sinus node dysfunction, how does that relate to sick sinus syndrome? Sick sinus syndrome is essentially the combination of sinus node dysfunction and symptoms secondary to it. The most common symptoms are lightheadedness and syncope, though others occur as well, such as palpitations, fatigue, and even symptoms of heart failure. In addition, about one half of patients with sick sinus syndrome have a condition slightly more specific called the tachycardia bradycardia syndrome, or more often just tachybrady syndrome for short. This is the combination of sick sinus syndrome and atrial tachyarrhythmias, usually AFib or a flutter. Here's a great instructional rhythm strip from someone with the tachybrady syndrome. The first six beats are part of a rapid, irregularly irregular, narrow complex tachycardia without discernible P waves, so almost certainly AFib. Then the patient spontaneously converts out of AFib, followed by a pause of about two seconds while the dysfunctional sinus node sort of wakes up, and then this is followed by sinus bradycardia at about 45 beats per minute. This is classic tachybrady. Interestingly, the patient's symptoms will often vary dramatically between the two arrhythmias. The tachyarrhythmia is often asymptomatic, but when symptomatic, those symptoms are usually palpitations or once in a while chest pain, while the post-conversion pause and subsequent bradycardia triggers lightheadedness. So some patients can tell exactly when they are switching back and forth between the two arrhythmias. The post-conversion pause is an example of overdrive suppression, which is also discussed in my advanced EKG video on miscellaneous electrophysiology topics. Why patients can end up with both problems is not entirely clear. Certainly, some of the etiologies of sick sinus syndrome, such as atherosclerosis and infiltrative cardiomyopathies, can also lead to tachyarrhythmias too, but the association between sinus node dysfunction and atrial tachyarrhythmias seems too strong for there not to be a better connection or stronger connection than that. Unfortunately, it's not even clear whether most patients develop the sick sinus first and then the paroxysmal tachycardias, or vice versa. I can certainly imagine a situation in which paroxysmal AFib that is poorly rate controlled is the initial pathology, which then leads to atrial remodeling over time as a consequence of the rapid atrial depolarizations, and this remodeling then damages the sinus node, but it seems unknown as to whether that plays any significant role in the mechanism. The treatment of sick sinus syndrome, assuming the cause is not something easily reversible like beta blocker toxicity, is a pacemaker. That's really the only choice there are no oral medications that will speed up the heart rate or improve sinus node dysfunction in a reliable and safe manner. Patients with tachybrady syndrome are often given a combination of a pacemaker for the bradycardias and an AV nodal blocking agent such as a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker to prevent rapid ventricular response during the tachyarrhythmias. I'm going to end this video with something a little different, a Venn diagram to graphically illustrate the relationship between sinus node dysfunction, sick sinus syndrome, and tachybrady syndrome. So this blue circle will represent all people with sinus node dysfunction, and the red circle will be all the people with atrial arrhythmias, specifically AFib and a flutter. And then the green oval are all the patients with arrhythmia-related symptoms, which can be either of the syncope lightheadedness variety, the palpitations and chest pain variety, or a mixture of both. Six sinus syndrome is represented by this group in turquoise, that is, the subset of patients with both sinus node dysfunction and symptoms, and the tachybrady syndrome is represented by this group in orange, those with sinus node dysfunction, atrial arrhythmias, and symptoms. That concludes this video on sinus node dysfunction and the sick sinus syndrome. If you found it interesting and helpful, I'd recommend that you check out my other EKG videos as well.